Scripture gives us a great verse for this morning with all of the things that Ryan shared with us. Is it possible that we as the American church, and by that I'm talking about uh, a national thing, but I, I don't want us to dismiss ourselves and somehow let eagle off the hook. Is it possible that we as the American church have become so subnormal as compared with what the New Testament church is supposed to be like, that normal now looks like us. Like it is actually weird if people look like the New Testament. Verse 14, right before the passage that was just read, says, this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Lord Jesus, we do pray that with all of the things that we brought in here with us and even losing an hour and the snow and that this would be a moment for us to come into your presence for you to shake us out of the slumber. Possibly of being stale in our faith. Possibly have given in to a minimalist perspective on what it is to live with you. Like we're just skating by. We're just doing the bare minimum. I pray, Jesus, that by your spirit you would awaken us. That we might have the opportunity not only to see you in these moments, but to be transformed and changed by you. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Drunkenness and debauchery. Like who wants to preach that sermon? Debauchery is depravity, corruption, and wickedness, and all of those things excessively. You ever hit a passage of Scripture as you're reading through the Bible that maybe feels so irrelevant to your life that you sort of skip over the verses? Like drunkenness may not be your issue. And debauchery is not a word that I often hear being used to describe the people that live around us. A possible casualty of such a reading is that we miss the point of the passage where we find an incredibly strong command from the Apostle Paul and it isn't the command to not get drunk on wine. Which, by the way, for the believer is super important, right? It's something that Christians need to be very thoughtful and careful about. Exercising our freedom while being careful about not only excess, but about our attitude toward others regarding alcohol. Toward those who drink alcohol and those who don't drink alcohol. And I think it's actually becoming increasingly awkward for the Christian in the church who doesn't drink alcohol. We need to go before the Lord and just ask him to help us with those things. This passage, though, can get distracted by alcohol and drunkenness and actually miss the point. There are two exceptional places in the Bible where we can study the church. Those two places are the book of Colossians and the book of Ephesians. What is the church and who makes up the church and who is the head of the church? These two books are often called twins because they share 75 out of, out of 155 verses in common. You want the shortcut? Colossians is the shorter one. In the book of Colossians, we focus on Jesus as the head of the church. In the book of Ephesians, we focus on the people as the body of the church. It's the Christ of the church and the church of the Christ. We have been studying in the book of Ephesians. Chapters 1 through 3, we've walked through the description of doctrine and spiritual privileges of the church, what Pastor Eric called the calling of the church, and then through the exhortations and spiritual responsibilities of those in the church in Ephesians 4 through 6, the conduct of the church, who we are and what we do as church. Eric and Ted have preached some rather challenging passages about Christian living about living the new self life, covers our attitudes and our actions, covers our thoughts and our minds, our words on our lips, our obedience to our king. From here, we begin to dig into incredibly important relationships like marriage and parenting and even our employment. 
It's actually quite a lot. And it can be overwhelming to even think about trying to pull these things off in our day and age and culture. Frankly, I'm not even sure we need to look beyond ourselves to get overwhelmed. Ted preached a few weeks ago a sermon about what me and I want. What me and I wants at its worst shows up in Ephesians chapter 5. And we quickly realize that I'm enough of an issue all by myself to get to a place where I throw up my hands on living the Christ life with any measure of faithfulness and effectiveness. And I think it's this sense of failure to measure up, to reach the bar. Did you catch Ted's picture last week? There was a bar and then there was another bar. This sense of failure to measure up and reach the bar usually leads us into one of two places. Two paths for the subnormal. One is drunkenness and debauchery. Being controlled by sin. Whatever your particular version of that looks like. We're controlled by these things. And we end up giving up on our faith. And we stop pursuing Jesus. And we stop praying. And we stop attending. And we do everything we can to walk away from our faith. While we have to medicate ourselves with some drug of choice to find escape and moments of pleasure that Pastor Eric has been preaching about. Again, let's not be too quick to give ourselves a free pass on being controlled by some, something out there by participating in some form of debauchery. Repentance in those moments is the gift of God for us to turn away from sin and turn toward Jesus. It's God's gift to us to say, you can actually come out of this debauchery at whatever level. Turn back to Jesus and walk with him. This sense of failure to measure up and reach the bar may lead us down a second path. It's the path of constant striving in our own strength and conniving efforts. If I ever had the opportunity to share with you a a bit more about my own story, my own testimony, striving is my word. And for whatever reason, at the beginning of this year, as I've been studying scripture, the word conniving has been the word I've been stuck on. And I would encourage you sometime in the next couple months, go back and read the first few books of the Old Testament again and pay attention to all of the human efforts, the striving and the conniving that people engaged in to accomplish something, even to accomplish what they consider to be obedience to God, often through manipulation an effort, striving and conniving, Abraham and his wife, or sister, depending on whichever one he needed her to be in the moment, Jacob and his brother Esau, Jacob and his mama, Jacob and his father, Jacob and his father-in-law, Jacob was really good at this. Go back and read about Jacob wrestling with God, right? Moses and the Egyptian that he killed. David and Uriah. You want to talk about some conniving stuff. David and his census. Hey, let me just see how big my army is here. People are so good at striving to accomplish even what we might consider good things like obedience only to find that the struggle is constant and the victories are limited. And it's into that reality that Satan shows up and has a field day messing with our lives. Giving us his lies. Look at all that effort you have put into this and you're still lousy at it. Look at all the ways you have been striving to accomplish that and you've never gotten there. Convincing us that we are permanent failures and ruined. That our guilt says we sinned, that our shame says our sin defines us, and that condemnation says our sin will always define us. That's where the Lord finds some of you right now. In that place where you know that you have sinned, you you figure that your sin defines you, and you're pretty certain your sin will always define you, and you're stuck in that spot. And it's at this point that we have a choice to make. Since we're all still alive, 
And we have to figure out how we're going to walk day by day with some in this sense of never measuring up. Like every day when I wake up, I have the opportunity to say, well, I guess I'm going to fail again today. That's where we find ourselves. I think we have a choice to make. We as the church, the big church, and let's just maybe say Eagle Church, could change the definition of normal. Of what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus. We redefine the Christian life in such a way that mediocre efforts toward obedience become the new norm. It is perfectly normal in the American church for people to barely pray. It is perfectly normal in the American church for people to hold the authority of Scripture just slightly above their Facebook feed or the advice of their friends. It is perfectly normal in the American church for people to have no meaningful relationship with making disciples. By that I mean we haven't been discipled, we aren't being discipled, and we're not discipling anyone. And you need to understand there's a difference between raising a child and making a disciple. The whole world raises children. No meaningful connection to making disciples and friends. That's like the thing Jesus gave us to do. Like, I almost want to say, that's all he gave us to do. He said, I'm going to leave you guys there. And when I leave you there, I'm leaving you there so that you can go and make disciples of all nations. That's it. It's perfectly normal in the American church to come to church with a me-centered mindset. I talked to a pastor recently who had some folks in his church come and hand them a list of what they wanted to see happen in the church if they were going to stick around. And I would love to tell you that that list said things like, I want to see lost people being found. I want to see the gospel being shared. I want to see new believers being discipled. That's not what was on the list. It might as well have been titled, What I Want for Me in This Church If I'm Going to Stick Around. you got that list I just would encourage you take it to Jesus and ask Jesus like here's what I'd like to see out of your bride lying gossiping slandering bitterness anger lack of forgiveness indulging sensuality compromise in order to maintain peace greedy for more all the time who's shocked by any of that I am not sure there's anything you can put at the end of the sentence that starts with a Christian would never, what? There's nothing you can put there that we're going to be surprised by. I believe we've lowered the bar and created a new normal. Today I'm going to call it subnormal. It is below what scripture lays out. And rather than fight that, we become content with that. And then we just rally some other folks around us who can be content with that with us. So that as we look around, we're like, okay, I got some people with me. Just live right here in this spot. And then we come to our youth in the American church. I have to admit I'm a little behind on my catching up on the sermons at Eagle but I just listened to one that Pastor Eric preached. Just listened to like two days ago, and I already put this stuff in there. I thought, man, he's saying the same stuff that I wanted to say today. We're losing our young people in countless numbers. For whatever's going on with Asbury and the other schools, I think Jesus is up to something to say, listen, I'll do it myself. I will directly intervene in the lives of these young people. Subnormal has become normal for the vast majority of American believers who today look nothing like the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. Who look nothing like those who are taking up their cross and laying down their lives daily to follow Jesus. It actually gets weird when people live out the New Testament. It just looks strange. Stephen Prothero, professor of religion at Boston University, says in the United States, Jesus is widely hailed as the king of kings. Great. 
But it is a strange sort of sovereign who is so slavishly responsive to his subjects. The American Jesus is more a pawn than a king, pushed around in a complex game of culture and countercultural chess, sacrificed here for this cause and there for another. I don't think we need any other quotes to be able to recognize that the book of Ephesians picture of the church and the American picture of the church are not in a tight relationship with one another. We are as a people below the line of what the Apostle Paul is commanding and what Jesus is desirous of. And if we're not yet convinced, we just go back to last week when Ted shared the the passage that says, be perfect then as your heavenly Father is perfect. So says Jesus. Which I think, friends, leads us to a second choice, a second option of what happens when we realize we don't want to walk down the road of debauchery. We cannot live this life in our own strength, and we refuse to simply lower the bar. Can you join me in that? No matter where culture goes, no matter where society goes, no matter where our fellow churches go, we are the ones who say we refuse to simply lower the bar. Where does that leave us? I think it leaves us in the beautiful place of surrender and dependence on the Spirit of God. It's a hard, twisted road that we walk to get to the point of Paul's passage and this great invitation of the God of grace who's been trying to tell his people all along. Ever since the Old Testament, we read about the law, this signpost that was given to the people to say, you guys, here's the standard and you cannot do it alone. The God of grace has been trying to encourage us this one thing. Do not let anything control your life other than the Spirit of God. You don't have to let anything control your life other than the Spirit of God. You don't need to let anything control your life other than the Spirit of God. It's not like he's somehow insufficient to pull this off. God has provided a way, a gift. So, After we've heard all of this about the conduct of the church of Christ and after all of the striving and the effort that has led to frustration and apathy, I want to read these verses again. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Be filled with the Spirit. Those words should ring in our ears and sit in our hearts, not as some kind of restriction on our lives. But it's a beautiful gift from God that allows us to actually live the life that Jesus created us to live. God the Father is so sure that what you and I need is the filling of the Spirit in our daily lives that he gifts us with what Swindoll argues is Paul's strongest imperative. Command. An active and ongoing command. It's not passive. This doesn't happen to us in our sleep. We have a role to play in this one. Before we get into that role, let me remind us of who the Holy Spirit is. He is a full-fledged member of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He is not a force, a power, an it. He is not an extreme part of the Christian faith. He is not a next-level relationship for those who want to somehow move beyond a relationship with Jesus into something higher or something greater. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. We have been given the Spirit of God the moment we receive Jesus. And when you receive the Spirit of God, you got all of him. You did not get part of him like you got part of your spouse at your wedding, and 10 years later, you got the other part. That's not how this works. 
The entire Holy Spirit shows up in our lives at conversion. So Paul has already announced to the Ephesian church, to the believer, they are indwelt with God's Spirit. Now Paul gives the rest of the outpouring of the work of the Spirit as he fills us and thereby controls, empowers, and enables us. We have a role to play in this one. A choice of fillings. We can fill our lives with all sorts of other things. Paul chose the example of alcohol in Ephesians chapter 5. He's using a well-known vice and issue in Ephesus. Everyone would understand. Everyone knew what he was talking about. And for the folks in Ephesus, this got even more complicated because alcohol was a part of their worship to the Greek god of wine named Bacchus. So here was the deal. In order to worship Bacchus, you would drink. And when you became drunk, Bacchus could control you. We might look back at that and be like, hey, there might have been something else going on there. But that was the thought. Worship your God by drinking. Let him take over. And then you're drunk. And now Bacchus gets to control your life. And the people would look out on the street and see all kinds of people worshiping Bacchus out there, being controlled by him. Paul says, not that, instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, just wrestle through the fact that the Apostle Paul puts these two things right next to each other. Like, this is, this is a community where there would have been the rooftops, and people could look down on the street and watch what was going on. Paul says, it's not that. Y'all know what that is. It's this. It's not controlled like that. It's controlled like this. It's not that people are going to look at you and see Bacchus being worshipped. They're going to look at you and see God being worshipped. He puts these two things right next to each other. So what is our role in this? Well, it's not to fill myself with the Spirit like I fill up my gas tank. It really isn't even that I need to find sort of the spiritual gas station and then someone else is going to fill me up. There's significant danger in the American church of thinking that our pastors and leaders somehow hold the ability to impart the Spirit for us. Or worse, that somehow these folks are going to manage our spiritual lives on our behalf. Like, hey, pastor, you chew the word up for me, would you? And then spit it out. Don't make it hard. Don't make it challenging. Just tell me what it is, and then I'll go home and do my thing. That's unfortunate. It's also unfortunate when we get to the place where we're saying, I've got to go to a place, a building at a certain time to be able to encounter the Spirit of God. COVID locked down the church that I was pastoring, the same that locked down every other church. I had a guy who insisted I have to go to the building at 10 a.m. in order to give my offering on Sunday. I was like, brother, I got stuff to do. This Zoom thing's eating my lunch. I can't go to the church so you can give your offering at 10 a.m.? What's that about? See you on Monday. We get to the place where we're like, this is it. This is it. Do you remember what Ted said last week? This 75-minute thing is not enough. Some of you are like 75. (laughs) What am I supposed to do? I think our role from Ephesians chapter 5 is I need to be obedient to not fill my life up with something else that will consume and control me. And I want to encourage us. We need to be careful not to fill our lives up with something else that we don't think will consume and control us until it is. Because I think that's where most of us are, right? We're not full-blown debauchery. That's too far out there. We're just like nibbling at it having a snack on debauchery. And then before we know it, it's actually running our lives. We need to be careful not to fill ourselves up with something else so that we can bring the fuel tank of our lives to the Lord and present it as empty. Now, here's the really good news. Somebody when I was eight years old needed to tell me this, and I'm not sure that they did. The really good news is Jesus will help you empty this. You don't even have to do that on your own. He will help you empty your life of the other things. 
We need to empty our lives of the things the American church has become really comfortable with. A full tank of me. Maybe, maybe this afternoon, do a quick evaluation of your wallet and your credit card and your bank statement and your calendar. Maybe think through those things that consume you from the moment you wake up in the morning and the things that keep you from being able to fall asleep at night and ask the Lord if these things aren't running your life for you. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, it's a command. And it's conditional. God doesn't just do this one for us. There's an instead in there. <laughs> like, you're going this way, instead, go this way. And it's continual. It's daily. Repeated opportunity. For the Apostle Paul, a relationship with the Holy Spirit was a daily reality of dependence and connection. This relationship then leads to a life that is surrendered and dependent on the Lord. So that Jesus is king of our lives and his spirit empowers us to live as children of the Father. We are therefore under his control. And when people see us, they say, wow, those folks are actually imitating God. Which if you go back to the beginning of Ephesians chapter 5 is exactly what Paul told us to do. Be imitators of God. Friends, I'm not sure this is supposed to be complicated. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. Somewhere back in the day, though, we took some wrong turns as the church in relationship to the Spirit of God. Some of us resigned the Holy Spirit to the cemetery like he does nothing anymore. Some people resigned the Holy Spirit to the crazy circus. Like he's just out of control and weird and we've got to guard against the Spirit. Some people have the Holy Spirit locked up in a historical box and sort of on display in the book of Acts. Others have him as a spiritual superpower for personal benefit. Some can find the Holy Spirit to just ministry within the church. Do you know your spiritual gift or gifts? And do you know how that gift or gifts works outside of the Sunday morning thing? Some try to over-explain what they consider to be the Holy Spirit's movement in their lives so that they can receive some sort of personal attention. Some people have made the Holy Spirit all about external displays of some sort of spirituality that becomes about the show rather than about obedience. We use stories of the Holy Spirit to puff us up as super spiritual. And along the way, many of us were so turned off by all of these things that we ran the other way and said the Holy Spirit needs to be guarded and cautiously engaged. Other people have concluded that the Holy Spirit's power and work in a person's life is mostly just for the super spiritual people. He doesn't really relate to the normal person. He doesn't really show up in our family room or our neighborhood he doesn't really show up in our business life or on vacation. And we've actually put the Holy Spirit in what I'm calling the abnormal category. For Paul, being filled with the Spirit of God in the Ephesian church was as normal as the heathens in Ephesus worshiping the God of wine and being controlled by the alcohol. It wasn't rare. It wasn't resigned to a small sect over in the corner of society. This is what people did. I would imagine a bunch of them did this every single day. Living in a relationship with the Spirit of God is what we do all the time. Tozer says, you must be satisfied that this is nothing added or extra. The Spirit-filled life is not a special deluxe edition of Christianity. It is part and parcel of the total plan of God. You must be satisfied that it is not abnormal. He goes on, I admit that it is unusual because there are so few people who walk in the light of it or enjoy it, but it is not abnormal. What if the Holy Spirit decided he's never coming into your house again? Would anybody in your family notice? What if the Holy Spirit said, I'm done joining them at Eagle on Sunday mornings? Would we notice? What would be different? 
If the Holy Spirit said, Kurt, I'm done in your marriage, would my wife notice? The plan of God is that the Holy Spirit would indwell our lives at conversion and then reign in our lives as we are careful how we live, not as unwise, but as wise, by not being filled or controlled by the things of the world, but rather filled and controlled by the Spirit of God. And I love that Paul put Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 in this context surrounded by all the things that have been preached before and all the things that I anticipate are coming. Because you know what we read? We read normal life stuff. A context that talks about the thoughts in my mind and the words on my lips and the attitudes in my hearts. A context that talks about my relationship with my wife. A context that talks about how I engage with my kids, how I live my life at work, that talks about sexuality, that talks about our desires, that talks about all of our relationships with other people. This is normal life stuff. For the Christian, the Spirit of God wants to empower, is willing to empower us to live the life that we were originally created, and then after sin entered the the story, redeemed, to live. And he wants to show up as a normal everyday relationship. Not just Sunday mornings, not just short-term mission trip, not just some portion or percentage of my money and my time, but all of it. Can you imagine how blessed people around us will be as we live a spirit-filled life? You probably can relate to this if you're married, but I'm certain that my wife could care less about my engagement with the Spirit of God for 75 minutes in this room if I never engage with the Spirit of God at home. I assure you she could care less. She's sitting right over there. You can ask her when we're done. Our kids are probably utterly confused if we only engage with the Spirit of God in this context where our kids are over here and we're over here. They can't even see us. It's what Eric said, I think, on February 19th. We're confusing these young people. They're like, enough of this thing where you say this and do this. That makes no sense to us. Our neighbors, my neighbors, could really use some spirit-filled people running around. Our schools could really use some spirit-filled young people running around. Your employees could really use a spirit-filled boss. And bosses, I imagine you would love to have some spirit-filled employees. I think this is possible for all of us. How? Start with owning the subnormal. Would you start by owning that? We're sinners. We're messed up people. We've made a new normal that Jesus didn't give us. Reflect on your life, and every once in a while, just allow this question to go through your mind. Did Jesus ask me to do that? And we can't fix it on our own. Let there not be even a hint, Ted said, out of Ephesians 5, of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity. Okay, maybe some people in this room are okay so far. Or of greed. I'm not sure that one preaches so well in America. Not even a hint of these things. Guys, we're done. We're done. We're done. Let's not argue that. Let's let's not excuse that. Let's own that. Sinful people. Debauchery may not be your word, but we're infinitely messed up as we stand before a holy God. Let's own it. And recognize we're not the ones who are running away from the Lord, right? We're not going to be the ones who simply run away from the Lord. We're still here. There are plenty of moments in my prayer life with Jesus where that's all I can say. I'm still here, Lord. It's all I got. I might barely be here, but I'm still here. 
We acknowledge our reality and our need and we confess our sin to God and we repent of the subnormal attitude that has established a low bar that we become comfortable with. Spell that out in as much detail as you need to with the Lord. Confess your sin, turn away from your sin and let Jesus come and do what Jesus said he wanted to do. Ephesians chapter 3, I pray, Paul says, that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this, surpass, this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And he's going to do infinitely in your life more than you can imagine. This is the gift. We don't have to somehow fight with God or convince God or earn something from God. I don't need to connive or strive. I don't have to prove it to God or hide from God. His deep love desire for us is that we be filled with his spirit. And so we bring our empty lives and we watch him fill us and change us and transform us. And when you discover a place in your life where you're like, yeah, yeah, but don't feel transform and change that area, that's your new alcohol that leads to debauchery. Confess that, repent of that, turn to the Lord and let him fill that space in your life. Tozer concludes, I have to be convinced and arrive at the place where I know that the Holy Spirit is for me. That a part of the work of Christ on the cross and in my heart is to give me the, the right to a full spirit-filled life. So Eagle, can we bring some empty tanks before the Lord and ask him to fill us up? You may need to trash some stuff, burn some stuff, break off some relationships. We all need to, to consider the time and live as wise folks, not unwise. Make the most of every opportunity. Quick math. Average attendance on, at Eagle on a Sunday morning, if every one of us wastes five hours a week, I'm pretty sure we do more than that. That's 100,000 hours a year. I think Paul's saying, listen, folks, be careful. Don't waste your life. Don't fill your life up with all these other things. Come empty to the Lord. Be careful how you live. Present an empty vessel to the one who loves you and created you for himself. He is eager to fill us. And he will fill us daily. And we have the privilege of walking in the fullness of the power and provision of the Spirit of God. I read ahead in the book of Ephesians. I want to encourage you, if you are married, if you have children or you are children, that's everybody in the room, you might want to think about this sooner rather than later because we're going to start to get into some passages about some, some beautiful and rather complicated relationships that we have in life. The only path forward and the only path from where we've come is living a spirit-filled life. Jesus, we are so grateful that you have given us a gift that you did not at any moment think that we were going to pull this off on our own. And you didn't leave us to figure that out. Father, I'm grateful for all the stories in the Old Testament of people who were striving and conniving to try to do something. And you made it really clear that doesn't work out. And into the midst of that, Lord, you said, I'm going to do it for you as you invited us to not be controlled by all sorts of other things, but to come to you and be filled with you. Father, would you help us to be people who are surrendered and dependent, that the world may taste of our lives and see that we are imitators of God. We are children of the light. We are not unwise, but wise. And all those crazy people running around drunk on the street giving great glory and praise to the God of wine turn into a bunch of people who may look weird to the world and may sometimes even look weird in the church. But we reflect our Father because you've empowered us to live the life that you created us to live. We're grateful. Help us not to run from this opportunity but to run to you to be filled by your spirit and to live in relationship, a relationship surrendered and dependent 
on the one who created us and loves us. Father, for your glory we pray. Amen.